Hello, we are live again from the Chadal Museum of Yesteryear. Uh, thank you for joining us here on this uh, wonderful talk. I'm really excited about this one. Who doesn't like food, uh, <laughs> especially food in Milwaukee? So we are joined by uh, author and editor and, um, uh, well, she runs her own business as well, entrepreneur, right? Jennifer yeah. Brock, uh, <laughs> with her new book, Classic Restaurants of Milwaukee. Um, Jennifer, why don't you uh, introduce yourself a little bit more and uh, we'll just get right into this. Yeah, great. So hi, everybody. I'm Jen. Um, this book published on November 2nd. It is my sixth book, I think. <laughs> four Wonderful. of them history. Yeah, four history, two historical cookbooks. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm an author. I'm an editor. I do so many different things <laughs> in addition to the books. So I'm... I'm excited about this. Um, so thank you for having me, by the way. This is so fun. You're welcome. You're so also a museum visitor. You've, you've come several times to the show now. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the museum. There's so many cool things to see. And then the gift shop is great. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the presentation, I'm going to start by talking about the book. Um, now bear with me everyone because I've not run a PowerPoint presentation and a live stream at the same time so I'm a little uh, new to it <laughs> but so I just want to start talk start off talking about the book you can see a picture of it right there on the screen you can also see my flag copy <laughs> right here um, so the book it covers obviously classic restaurants of Milwaukee, um, places that people have absolutely loved throughout the history of the city. Um, there's about 150 restaurants in it, and that was whittled down from a list of about 400. <laughs> so it was pretty extensive research for me. Um, there, It's broken out into multiple chapters. So there's one for breakfast, there's one for lunch, one for dinner, one for desserts um, and one for drinks. And then there's also a chapter of vintage recipes and that has about 20 recipes from um, different places like the sunshine cake is in there from Watts Tea Room. We've got uh, poppers with a twist from Saz's, the Shazlik from the pa uh, public natatorium and JJ Garlic's. So wow. things like that. Yeah, yeah, there's a ton. And those I'm all- I'm excited to get my book and read those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can have a, a vintage Milwaukee recipe party, like dinner party, a virtual dinner party, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so the process of creating the book, I, I had my own research and my own experience about what restaurants I really wanted to include, but I also wanted to make sure that I got input from everyone else <laughs> that I could possibly get input for from. So I had a couple one-on-one -on -one meetings with a few friends of mine, and then I posted in some Facebook groups like the Old Milwaukee group. Um, I'm sure some of the members of that group are on right now. So thank you guys so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, it netted me about 400 to 450 restaurant suggestions. Um, and then to get through those, I first had to go through and see like which ones were actually historical and which ones were um, a little bit too new. So the the newest one, I have barred a lot of restaurants in there and they're the newest ones opening and that opened in the 90s. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it as far as like how new it gets. But from the past, the oldest one is 18, early or late 1800s, I think it opened. Um, so yeah, so I went through to figure out which ones were actually classics, which ones had some great, history with them and then which ones had pictures and so there are about 200 pictures in the book um, and they're taken from historical societies from personal collections of different people i had one person um, actually physically mail me the menu for abu's jerusalem of the gold which is just <laughs> so cool oh. so yeah so i've got the actual menu um, in my research over there um, and then uh, some restaurant owners uh, also sent me pictures via email. Uh, I probably had just as many photos to sift through as I did about uh, as I did of restaurants. So probably about 400 to go through and figure out which ones would be the best to include. 
Um, so that's basically how I came about the book. So I want to go through, okay, I want to go through some of the places in the book to talk about, just, just to pull out some things that I know were really specifically loved in the city um, and to highlight some of their history. So the first one is Coffee Trader, which I'm sure many of you remember. Um, Coffee Trader actually, Coffee Trader was a coffee shop slash diner slash <laughs> slash everything they pretty much could be. Like you could get sandwiches, you could get coffee drinks and cocktails and things like that. So um, they actually didn't open first as a coffee shop. They were originally just a shop selling coffee beans out of the storefront. Really? Yeah, which I found to be really interesting because you don't really think of that, right? Like when you think of coffee shops now, you think like Starbucks or like Hi-Fi right. and Bayview, right? Um, which I believe used to be a mini mart, if I'm not <laughs> mistaken. Um, but it, the coffee shops now don't really seem to evolve from just bags of beans, <laughs> essentially. Right. Um, they, they still might have those, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They could roast them. They could do that themselves there, too. But it's it's mostly just, you know, we're going to open a coffee shop, not we're going to open a coffee bean shop. Um, but beside the point. So they opened as an actual coffee shop in 1975. And what I was something that's really interesting about it is that they now this is local legend. Um, I'm not 100% sure how accurate this is. But supposedly they had the first espresso machine in Milwaukee. Wow. Yeah. So I guess espresso drinks were not very popular in 1975. I wasn't around yet. So I don't really know. <laughs> um. Yeah, so they had the first espresso machine in Milwaukee. They became instantly popular. Um, and it was for a few reasons, right? You could go there, you could hang out for hours. No one would kick you out. You were just allowed to sit there and do whatever you want, chat with your friends, drink the same cup of coffee for the entire day. Um, now, and have this your was espresso. located where in Milwaukee? That was the east side, I'm pretty sure. East side, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard question. Oh, very right much now. still uh, like a, where the Colectivo or Altera started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So in the maybe the coffee center of Milwaukee, right? Yes. <laughs> Italians <laughs> over there, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so it was popular because you could hang out forever. You could get your espresso that you couldn't really get anywhere else in the city at that point. Um, and then the celebrities caught on. I know Robin Williams visited. Um, there were, you know, other celebrities that came. And they also hosted themed events. So one of my favorites so is it was the 300th anniversary of uh, the Venetian Cafe, I think is what it was called, um, in Europe and they had a big party for it and then they had a party for Mardi Gras and then but Kieran O'Brien who supplied this drawing this drawing was like on t-shirts and flyers and things like that Kieran O'Brien did a lot of marketing for them and he so graciously let me come to his house and <laughs> go into his basement and take pictures of these gigantic posters that he made for them <laughs> for for you know marketing purposes and this was one of them and I think it says a lot about the it just kind of the ethos of the place, right? Like it's casual, it's homegrown, it's it's kind of artsy. Um, and you just get, like even from this picture, you just kind of get the feeling that you want to sit there for a while. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they, they were popular for a really long time. They closed in the 90s. And I'm sorry to say for people who still love the coffee trader, Generally, it was because people thought the food was mediocre and the service was terrible. So, <laughs> I only went there a couple times myself, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that seems to be the general. Yeah, it's tough. It. It's tough with restaurants. You, yeah. you probably have that same story throughout the whole book here. Yeah, in a lot of places. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't want to. I, I didn't actually try the food, so I don't know how mediocre it was, but. <laughs> but uh, it closed in the 90s. People still love it, though. There's a Facebook group related to it. Um, it's I remember the coffee trader on Downer Avenue, I think. Um, and, you know, people still go in there and share stories. There are old waitresses and waiters that go in there and share stories and things like that. So the memory of the coffee trader lives on 
uh, and now it's living on in the book. So yeah. the, the next one is the Oriental Pharmacy Tea House, or as many people know it, the Oriental Drugs Lunch Counter. Um, so this was the lunch counter in the Oriental Drugs Building. I think the pharmacy itself opened in the 1930s. I'm pretty sure, but the yeah. lunch counter came in a little bit after that. I'm not entirely sure the exact date that it came in. Do you know, Joel? Not the exact date, no, but yeah, yeah 30s, 30s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, on the east side, you know, right next to the Oriental Theater. Yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they kind of grew in popularity throughout the years, too. The hate for the lunch counter there was around the 1980s. Um, everybody, and what I learned <laughs> while I was writing this book about lunch counters that is really interesting to me is that apparently in lunch counter culture, when you want a, a, a seat at the counter, you don't like go in and talk to a host and wait, you just go and you stand behind somebody who's already sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> no and you just wait. Yeah, no pressure at all, right? You just wait and then if if they get dessert, the that means that they're gonna keep sitting there for a while. <laughs> but okay. if you don't get dessert, then you just kind of stand there and hover, and it kind of like freaks me out. So I don't think I. <laughs> I don't think able to handle it seems like more like something you would do in the cafeteria, at like a school. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like I'm, I'm waiting for your space. <laughs> did they ever lean forward and they were like, um, "How much longer are you going to be?" Like, it, mm -hmm. I don't know. It would just creep me out. Um, and I imagine that happened a lot at the Oriental Pharmacy Tea House because the owner never turned anybody away, which is just an absolutely lovely thing, even if they couldn't afford the food or they were just, you know, they were really in need of some food, but but for whatever reason couldn't, they, they got some food, which I thought was great. So there was a long familial history of this as well. So people would come in with their parents who came in with their parents and right, it yeah. continued Very on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. There were some people who said that they had been going since their first day of school, like when they were in first grade and they, <clears throat> they kept going with their parents and then they brought their own kids there and things like that. So it's a really nice history. And that kind of lent itself to the strong sense of community that was, there right so everybody kind of knew each other everybody got along people would walk in there after they were away on a trip and they would be like i'm home everyone and everyone <laughs> would come around and be like hey welcome back so um the other interesting thing about the oriental pharmacy tea house is that there's a sculpture of it it's currently on display in madison that was made by adolf rosenblatt and what i love about how he did this was he went to the lunch counter and he would sit down next to one of the regulars with his clay and he would just like watch them and sculpt them as they were sitting there. Really? Eating. That's how that yeah. happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when he, <laughs> so he sculpted them as they ate and then he made this huge sculpture and they had an opening for it and they invited all of the regulars from the lunch counter to come and like meet the clay versions of themselves. And they're not small either. Like when you think clay oh. figure, like you think like this, right? But they're pretty big. <laughs> and so, I mean, imagine how interesting that would be, right? Like to go and see, I don't know, a picture, a, a sculpture of you reading the newspaper or of you eating a sandwich or yeah. something. And they make like sure that. they'd have your eyeglasses mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. Or you had a necklace that you always wore or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And it was really detailed too. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was really detailed too, like even with little signs on the cash register and things like that. So that's on display in Madison. I can't remember off the top of my head which museum it is, but I do note it in the book. Um, and then some of the other things I liked about this, there was some unique uh, menu items. And one of them in particular is called Shrimp Shapes. And I only, I didn't, I only found a few people that remembered shrimp shapes from the Oriental Pharmacy Tea House, but listen to how disgusting this is. So <laughs> shrimp shapes, they weren't shrimp. They were chopped up pieces of seafood that were formed into the shape of a shrimp and then deep fried. Huh. So it was like, 
your your mock shrimp. Yeah, like your mock fish fried shrimp. shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I personally hate shrimp, so I mean I might try it just because it obviously it's not made hey, out of it's shrimp, deep but... fried. It's deep fried, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and what a way to use up like seafood that you can't sell, right? You just go sure. form it into yeah. something else and I fry it like chowder. chicken nuggets. Yeah, <laughs> 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 like chicken nuggets. Shrimp nuggets. Shrimp nuggets, yeah. <laughs> now that recipe is not going to be in your book, right? Wait, what? Is that recipe in your book? Oh, God, no. <laughs> you know what? Here's the recipe. Chop up your old seafood, mush it into a shrimp shape. And fry it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Oriental Pharmacy Tea House, it closed in 1995. Um, I believe that was also when the Oriental Pharmacy itself closed. It's now uh, occupying the space now is the Crossroads Collective Food Hall. And they have the old cash register from the Oriental Pharmacy Tea House. And um, the lunch counter also has a Facebook group of fans. I don't remember what that one is called. It might just be Oriental Oriental Drugs Lunch Counter or something. I think, yeah. Yeah. So maybe even just Oriental Drugs. Yeah. 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 Something like that. So, but they share amazing pictures in that group, and it's it's so fun because the sense of community is still there. Like someone will comment. Um, someone will post something and someone else will comment and be like, oh my God, you were my waiter. I remember this. And like, there's just great, really authentic, nice conversations that happen there. Um, so next is White Tower. And Joel, thank you, first of all, for letting me come to the museum and take a bunch of pictures of custard menus and these mugs and a few other things. I really- This is one of my personal favorite ones that you're covering, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it was invaluable that you let me do that. So White Tower is one of my favorite stories from the book. White Tower is basically a blatant ripoff of White Castle. So they opened shortly after White Castle started and the owners of White Tower they like really did their homework to make it almost exactly the same as White Castle. They went to White Castles, they measured the floor plans <laughs> so that they could copy it like inch for inch in their own restaurant. They used the same architecture with like the crenellations. They used the same color scheme. So everything was white, everything was sparkling or stainless steel. They had the same menu prices. They had the same burger style. They even stole employees from White Castle who they then brought in, put them to work and said, tell us if we're doing this the same way White Castle does it. So, <laughs> yeah, I so wonder they, if they got in any trouble, right? Ah, we'll see. So, <laughs> so they they like took it to the limit, right? To, to copy White Tower. They even had a very similar slogan. So White Castle slogan, buy them by the sack. White Tower slogan, take home a bag full. So, <laughs> not exactly the same, <laughs> but close. Same but, idea. <laughs> yeah. So White Tower started doing really well, right? By 1930, they were the one of the largest burger, burger, burger chains in the country. And that was because they positioned themselves really well. They were at intersections that were right by streetcar stops. Um, basically anywhere there's going to be a lot of traffic where, you know, a glimmering, shining white building would look like a great place to be because it was clean and, you know, the city was kind of dirty and sooty as like the whole country was, right, from all mm -hmm. the pollution and everything that went unchecked. So they were sued. Go figure. Right. <laughs> they were sued oh, wow. by White Castle in 1929 because... Obviously, White Castle was not so happy. So they, the, the first thing that they had to do was change their architectural style, which White Castle was like, yeah, this will really stick it to them. Nobody's going to want to go to White Tower anymore. But White Tower really seized on their popularity in the 1930s and changed it to an Art Deco style of architecture, which made them even more popular. Oh, so, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, but the interesting thing about that is with every renovation, because White Castle was, a, was successful when they sued White Tower, for every renovation that they did of a building, White Tower had to send pictures of the renovation to White Castle and White Castle had to approve it. Oh, so, that's yeah. Kind of a pain. It's kind of a pain, but I mean, you totally rip off an entire chain. Like, what are you going to do, right? So, oh. <laughs> 
So they also, White Tower also had to pay an $80,000 licensing fee to White Castle. Um, and a lot of it, money. A lot yeah. of money at that time. Yeah, definitely. And there were restrictions on where they could open. So if it was considered White Castle territory, you were not allowed to open a White Tower within that same oh, territory. Sure. Mm -hmm. So there, the last one closed in 1976, and they kind of fell out of popularity because... I think they, the streetcar stops either completely stopped being used um, or like they built the expressway or something. Mm -hmm. something I don't remember exactly. Um, so the last one closed in 1976. And I think there's only one or two White Tower like original buildings, buildings. still left. Mm -hmm. There's one in Racine. That's um, downtown Racine. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It stands out. <laughs> yeah, and I we, I find it so I was I saw it when I was little and I was like, oh, that's a neat building. But now that I know the story behind it, I find it like even more fascinating. So the moral of this story is don't rip off a very large fast food company. Because now, did you research who the owner was of the White Tower? Who who had started that? Yes, I did, and it's in the book. Um, I'd have to let me it's find amazing. it. Yeah. Hold on one second. I'll find it. You have all my little things flagged. But if you know, then you can go ahead and start talking about it and I'll jump in. It's it's the Saks Amusement Theater. Yes. People. The Saks Brothers. They started White Tower. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here it is. <laughs> so they built the Oriental Theater. They built, you know, mm -hmm. all these other theaters. And they're like, let's build restaurants, too. Yeah, so. they had, like, a whole conglomerate of, like, property, right? But yeah. which is interesting to me because they were already doing really well for themselves. So why would you need to like, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Hey, here's this cool thing that everybody like loves. Let's kind of copy it. Right. But you don't need to. Right. So I wonder how much they kind of. The Great Depression probably had a, a somewhat a similar effect on movie business as COVID yeah. is right now. That's true. I wonder oh. if anybody's going to resurrect the White Tower chain right now. Because <laughs> that would just be phenomenal. <laughs> well, I've Googled a lot of the White Tower, and there is still a Saks relative in the East Coast that uses White Tower like real estate. It's really? Name. Yeah, for the company. So <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You might not be allowed to, to resurrect it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's great. Um, yeah, so that's the story of White Tower. So next, we're going to talk about the public natatorium, which is another just very much a personal favorite. A lot of people. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So the public natatorium was originally a public pool. And in the late 1880s, Milwaukee opened, I think, like nine public pools around the city because you know, plumbing was not that great. People were still using outhouses and they needed like to bathe basically. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they would go to these public pools and they would, you know, wash themselves, swim for a little bit, use like indoor plumbing if they didn't have it at home. Um, but as plumbing got better throughout the city, the public pools began to close. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the last public natatorium building closed in 1990, uh, 1977. And two years later in 1979, the public natatorium restaurant opened. And so what's interesting about this restaurant is that it made use of the facilities that were already there. So they had the pool in the middle and there were tables around it. And then on a second level balcony, there were tables all around that. And in the pool, they had dolphins. So you would go there and you would get an indoor dolphin show while you ate your meal, which, you know, everybody loved it, even though there was some uh, controversy when they first started from animal rights groups and things like oh, that. Sure. It still was crazily popular. Like people just loved it. By 1981, they had two more dolphins. They had an entire exotic menagerie. They had, I think it was a macaw that would follow people into the bathroom and like <laughs> knock on the stall door with its beak. <laughs> and there's there's pictures of like people with monkeys on their shoulders or like feeding fish to the dolphins and stuff like that. So it, they did five dolphin shows daily. Um, and they, as you might expect, closed in 1985 because of animal abuse allegations. Yeah. So they, 
we're not keeping the water in the pool warm enough. And so oh, the sure. dolphins were getting sick. And they also were not able to <laughs> feed all of the animals properly because they were just hemorrhaging money into this restaurant. Like they were using really expensive China. It was something like $35 for a crystal glass or something like that. And they stocked the entire restaurant with them. Yeah. And the, the costs of just maintaining the pool and feeding animals were astronomical. So they went bankrupt. They got in trouble because they weren't taking care of their animals. The dolphins were rehomed to, I want to say a zoo in Miami, um, but it's in the book. I'd have, I'd have to double check, but it's just such a fascinating story, right? Like, did any dolphins pass away while they were doing all this? Not that I know of. I think okay. a couple of them just got sick. Got sick, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But to me, it seems like such a, like, so this opened in 1979, right? It seems like such a 1980s excess thing. It to does, do. yeah. 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 So, I mean, and I, I don't know. Would you have gone? Did you did you go to see a dolphin I show? Didn't know. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never even heard anything about this one. So I think I would have yeah. been curious. It sounds like go. it might have been much more of a high end than with the nice china. I mean, yeah. probably a good menu. Yeah, you know, the menu is a burger joint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the menu was pretty good. Um, they it was it was definitely more of a high end place, which kind of was their ultimate doom, right? Among other things. So yeah. So. 80s, mm -hmm. 80s were another kind of tough time for <laughs> yeah. a lot of things going out of business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So next is Giovanni's. Giovanni's was a classic Sicilian food restaurant. And I wanted to talk about this one specifically because of the manager. His name was Max Adonis. And well, okay, so technically his name was Max Ludwig Gajewski. And he, <laughs> he was such a character, right? He was like really mouthy. He would like yell at you if he didn't like you. And like you, like he would send people away from the restaurant if he didn't like the way you were. <laughs> and if, yeah. And if he didn't think you should have a close parking spot, he would just yell at you until you went and found one that was further away. <laughs> so he had one arm because he lost his other arm in a bread mixer incident. I don't wow. know a whole lot more about that, but just that's intense, right? Just that's yeah. intense. The dogs. So I can imagine, like, I understand why he's a little surly. So, but Max wanted to be a part of the Milwaukee Mafia so bad. Like, that was his goal, was to be in the Milwaukee Mafia. And he wanted to do that so bad that he pretended he was Italian and changed his name to Max Adonis. I don't know if he had it legally changed, but he told everyone his name was Max Adonis, you know, because it sounded more Italian. Sure. And, and he tried to befriend mobsters and he bragged to everybody about his mob connections. And he like always invited these mobsters into the restaurant. And that is ultimately his demise. So there was one night where he, there was like a, a drive-by shooting and they shot up his car and he didn't think anything of it. He was just like, Oh, it's just some local, like whatever playing and playing a prank or something or shooting my car. But then two weeks later, and this was in 1989, he was killed in the restaurant. So they had just closed and he was in the restaurant with one other employee and two guys came in and they basically assassinated him. And then the other person that was in there ran out and they shot her two and they got her in the arm and she survived but he died um the the crime is still unsolved but what's oh interesting goodness. yeah but what's interesting about this is that i think two years later they found two guys who matched the description that the other employee gave um and they were buried underneath a cement slab like in a parking lot so I guess they could have talked. Yeah, right. Hmm. So almost 100 percent sure that that Max's death was a mob hit. Um, Even though he wasn't in the mob, really. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But he really wanted to be. So maybe he was like getting too close to being in the mob. I don't know. Um, but so then I think they they resurrected the restaurant for a year or two in 2015, um, but that it didn't last. Um, 
So maybe one day they'll come. We have back. a comment that uh, Max was hurt at the A and P. The A and P. Yeah, that that's where he got hurt. Oh, okay. I'm curious about uh about uh how exactly that happened, but yeah. I don't know if I have the stomach to go into more details about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so next is Serbian food. So three brothers and Old Town Serbian Gourmet House um, are the two most loved Serbian restaurants in Milwaukee. They're both owned by the same family, which I didn't know before I started oh. researching this. Um, and it has such a great story. So Three Brothers was opened in 1956. And I'm sorry, I'm probably going to totally butcher his name. It was opened by Milun Radicevic. And he opened it after he had escaped a concentration camp during World War II. So he mm. had been living in England and was sponsored by a family in Milwaukee. And so he came up here and opened Three Brothers. And he was separated from his children during the Holocaust. And the restaurant was kind of a way to like put out to his family, hey, I'm here, come, come here, right? So he had three boys, hence the name Three Brothers. And they all ended up making it to Milwaukee and making it to the restaurant. They came in 1957 and 1958. And everybody started working there. And the owner now is Milan's granddaughter granddaughter or great granddaughter i'm not 100 sure but it, it, she says that every visiting family member comes to the restaurant like so they go to the <laughs> restaurant first. she calls it their family's ellis island which is just like so like knowing that he like was in a concentration camp and he had basically yeah. had to escape and come here like it's just such it's so like heartwarming of a story right. to know that he made it here and was able to open this place for his family. Um, so one of Maloon's sons opened Old Town Serbian Gourmet House in 1971. And that's what the picture is of their brick. And that okay. is- That yeah, looks amazing. <laughs> they are humongous. Like, you order one wow. and it lasts you like three days. Um, I had one with- beef in it there's some kind of meat in it and I just I ate very well for a very long time so. <laughs> wow. yeah. so they're both still owned by the same family um and yeah so that's yeah I didn't know that I, I yeah three brothers very very long you know very mm -hmm. interesting type of one but old town Serbian same family same family. same family yeah that was a surprise to me I didn't think they were the same family but it's so it's so neat like they're creating a little empire right yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um so next will be German food. The probably <laughs> what anybody in Milwaukee, like if, if someone asks you, like, hey, what, what are you known for? People are gonna say German food, come to German. our restaurants, right? Yeah. So these three are the big three, Maters, John Ernst, and Carl Ratches. Um, Mater's is currently the oldest restaurant in Milwaukee. They opened in 1902 and they survived prohibition. They survived world war II. They, I mean, they are just like how they've been able to adapt is amazing. So when they, when after prohibition, they served the first legal beer in Milwaukee as well. And what <laughs> before prohibition hit, they had a slogan that was something like, now it's beer and wine, but soon you'll just have the lake. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the drink. Yeah, that's so all you do. So while you can, right? <laughs> right, exactly. So, so during prohibition though, they they worked on their menu and and started cooking like really phenomenal German, traditional German specialties. And they became so popular for their food that when they reopened after prohibition, people started asking for the food too. So they just, they couldn't <laughs> go back to being just like a bar tavern kind of thing. They had to bring in all the food. Because uh, in the streets of old Milwaukee museum, it's just the rest, just the, the bar there. You go in, yeah. you walk into that one and it's just, oh, there's a bar, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it initially started as like a single glass storefront um, 
But that's another interesting story. So it started as a single glass storefront, but during World War II, the, there was a, a German kind of, I'm not exactly sure what about a single glass storefront made it seem German, but the owners during World War II remodeled it because they wanted to downplay the German theme. The German is to kind of keep people coming and now here we are it's like a bavarian country house more or less um so it's still in the same family it's on the fourth or fifth generation of ownership um and their giant pretzel is one of my dad's favorites and <laughs> i like their pretzel yeah i love everything, <laughs> everything you know with every meal <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah there's nothing there's there's nothing bad at maters the food is delicious so um, yeah, it's still in the same family. You should definitely go if you haven't been. It's a piece of Milwaukee history that's just amazing. Um, the John Ernst Cafe, that one is in the middle. That opened in 1878. It served old world specialties until 2001. Um, so they held the title of oldest restaurant in Milwaukee um, until 2001. When Meters took over because, you know, John Ernst went out of business. But then... Carl Ratches also, they they opened in 1904. So all of these German restaurants were just long time, like pieces of Milwaukee culture. Sure, so, very successful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Carl Ratches opened in 1904. It became really famous, really fast. Things that people loved about it were, there were Christmas time knickknacks that were up all year round. There were <laughs> German. That's German. Mm -hmm. Christmas. Yeah, there were. The, well, there. What are those figures? There's little porcelain figures, I think, that are German. There's a specific name for them. Um, oh, the specific type of ornament. Yes, I can't yeah. remember. <laughs> right now. I don't remember the name of it, but, but I mean, I'm sure that's part of what was up. So, and there were also paper paper tablecloths, but all of the things that people loved about it were removed in 2016 by a new owner who had plans to kind of modernize it. Sure, and, yeah. reformat the menu. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bring in a younger crowd and stuff like that. But it didn't work. People were mad. People were mad that he took the stuff out. And they, <laughs> he said that, you know, when people would come into the restaurant that had been coming there for decades, they would come in, see that the knickknacks were gone, see that the, tape, the paper tablecloths were gone, and they would just turn around and leave. They didn't want anything to do with it. No. So they... <laughs> okay, Carolyn comments that those were Hummels. Hummels yes, you should know. yes, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so people stopped coming. It closed abruptly in 2017 with just a sign on the door. Um, and it was it was felt by many as a very big loss for yeah. the city. Mm -hmm. So next is... Mustard. <laughs> and I want to talk specifically. In your dessert section, probably. Yeah, right? in dessert. So I want to talk specifically about Leon's um, because Leon Schneider was kind of a fixture in the custard scene, right? He wasn't the first custard stand, uh, but it's one of the another like big three, right? So yeah, he um, he he opened Schneider uh, opened Leon's in 1942 after he was the night manager at Gillis at Gillis's and I just want to point out that there is a controversy about how to pronounce Gillis's <laughs> I've only really learned myself recently <laughs> when I when I first visited I called it Gillies and that is wrong it's Gillis's with an apostrophe at the end right and they train their employees it's unrelated to Leon's so sorry but <laughs> they train their employees to say Gillis's instead of Gillies, and they have like a swear jar kind of, where if they say it oh, wrong, you put in the dollar. <laughs> yeah. So Leon Schneider was the night manager at Gillis's when he decided he wanted to open Leon's, and everybody knew him in the custard world in Milwaukee because he helped so many people get started. So he was just so, so generous with his time and with his knowledge. He signed permits for people for new custard stands. He helped scout locations for them. He designed their stands. He acquired equipment for them. He repaired people's equipment. And his son, by the way, still repairs the original custard equipment, which they're called colloquially iron lungs, <laughs> so, which is hysterical. But he, he trained people in his own shop and then 
like trained them on the entire operations and managing a custard shop and then would set them out into the world to open their own custard shop. So everybody loved him. He was wonderful. There is another Leon's in Oshkosh. It is not related. It used to be. <laughs> right, it, it used to be, okay. It used to be, yeah. Uh, Leon Schneider's mother opened it with all of the money in her savings. And then eventually it was sold to someone who was outside the family who licensed um, the name. There was a lawsuit essentially because they were trying to sell fried food and Leon's did not want fried food associated with the custard stand's name because they thought it would detract from the quality of the custard. I don't necessarily disagree. So um, sure. there was a whole lawsuit. Um, now they are two custard stands with the same name, just operating as independent okay. things. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, hold on. I lost my, I can't figure out how to, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> so I just want to give a couple little teasers of other fun stories in the book. Um, so the Goldman's lunch counter, there was a mystery when they closed of what happened to the lunch counter and where it went. And it was recently rediscovered in the past few years. And that story is in there. Um, Watts Tea Room, their very abrupt closure, which surprised a lot of people. Um, but the recipe for their sunshine cake is in the book. And that, that was the same, like Watts Tea Room was just an institution, right? People would go there with their parents and with their grandparents. And the sunshine cake, I think it was a James Beard award-winning cake, that recipe was. Wow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Suburbia is, there's, I think there's still one location, maybe two. Um, but that one is fun because there was a whole lawsuit over the spice blend that they put on sandwiches. And there was a tax evasion problem. And one of the original owners, the guy that originally opened it, like broke the locks on one of them after he had been like pushed out of the company. And it was a whole thing. It was hysterical. I love their creative name for the sandwiches. I know, I know. Yeah. It's so funny. <laughs> It's so funny. Um, so Snugs, that was a mafia restaurant. And the story in the book is about how they were taken down by the FBI, which involves a red phone and a fake birthday party. So it's really wow, that's a fascinating insane. story. Yeah. Um, the Cardaro Club was Milwaukee's first pizzeria. Um, the John Hawks Pub, there was a cool story about how a couple went there you know, every year for their anniversary. And then when it closed, they wanted to do something special with the booth that they went and sat in every year. So that story's in there. There's a story about the harp and how they had an Irish wake for it when it changed locations. Oh. And then, yeah. And then Von Trier is another favorite story of mine. Um, there was a bow and arrow murder mystery that happened there. So I believe that one is still unsolved, although they kind of know who did it, but it's not really possible to solve it but so that's <laughs> that's in there as well and then I wanted to go through some old pictures that didn't make it into the book but that I still liked so I just want to, a couple call outs like here we have the Gloriosa's first store um, and then next to that is Gillis's in the 1940s uh, with the long line, they were always super popular. Still <laughs> are obviously. It's my uh, nephew's favorite frozen custard place. So he's got good taste. <laughs> uh, so we've got the bakery sign. I love this sign. It's just so aesthetically pleasing. I think it's great. <laughs> yeah. We have the big boy sign. Obviously, big boy was a huge chain. Um, they went through a lot of different iterations. My favorite story about big boy though is that they decided hey, what would happen if we, you know, marketed this as a, a food chain that didn't have like a robust um, mascot? So, wow. so they, for a while, like took away all of the big boys and it didn't make any difference. So they put them all back. Oh. <laughs> it was a cool story. I think it's in on Milwaukee. That's like a graveyard of, of big boy statues. As some cool I've seen people boys. post that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so then next to that is a line outside of George Webb. Um, there's some fun stories about George Webb in the book about why each restaurant has two clocks and about yeah. how they uh, keep a, a baseball related promise uh, if they can. Um, and then next to that is the sunshine cake. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and then the next one is the old Palermo Villa restaurant before they were a frozen pizza champion. Frozen pizza chain, yeah. 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 They, That's they an interesting Palermo story. Mm -hmm. And they had a, yeah, there, there's some really interesting stuff about Palermo's. And then this last picture was from Captain's Steak Joint. And it is, oh, yeah. it is a boat shaped salad bar <laughs> <laughs> and they were pioneers of salad bar technology in like the entire restaurant industry and that's all really? yeah so like they invented the sneeze guard or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> really no yeah. i don't know if it was <laughs> okay about refrigeration and keeping the stuff on the salad bar cold and oh, i mean sure. But look at how beautiful this boat is, right? <laughs> if I could have a ship-shaped salad bar in my house, I would definitely put one in. <laughs> so that's the presentation. We've got some time for questions, if there are any. Uh, yeah, can you see the? there's a few yeah. comments on the side. I don't know if there's too many questions on there right now. Let me run through them. Someone knows shrimp shapes. <laughs> Yes, yes. And some people say it sounds great. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. A white tower building is on Teutonia between center and locust. Oh, it's painted purple now. Wow, that's rough. <laughs> okay, so Steve. Wow, I never really noticed it, but that's maybe why, because it's painted purple. Yeah. That's a weird intersection there at mm -hmm. Teutonia Center and Locust. Now even weirder that there's a purple building. There. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, thank you. Steve is saying that Adonis was a drug dealer and he was murdered by rival drug dealers and it was not a mob hit. Um, so I did mention it was potentially related to drugs in the book. So Steve, thank you for calling that out. Carolyn, yes, Hummels. Um, oh, Buzzy did it. Steve, again, yes, that's the Von Trier uh, bow and arrow mystery. Bow and arrow, yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen that covered on probably like a Shepherd Express or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was one of those mysteries that I didn't know about. And then when you read it, you're like, wow, that happened here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so weird. Yeah, I learned about it uh, through, um, through, I was on a bus tour with my parents um, who are both here. My mom is being very nice in the comments. <laughs> 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 um, so I learned about it on a bus tour with my parents. That was pretty neat. Um, Mary Louise, do you know anything about the restaurant Heaven City? I don't, unfortunately. Joel, do you know anything about the restaurant? No, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen like any pictures or anything really. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that might be one that we can explore and, and maybe find something and somebody will comment later on it. Yeah. Classic restaurants of Milwaukee part two. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, you, you got, it sounds like you got a lot of, uh, material to work with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah I'd hopefully like to we don't lose too many restaurants here during covid yeah, i hope so i hope so, so support them as you can yeah please do please do take out it's it's imperative just say you know everybody needs the support right now um so that looks like all the questions did i have something to eat from each restaurant no because some of them closed before i was born but <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of them, yes. So, um, Christy, you can get the book um, from Arcadia's website. The link is scrolling on the bottom. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's also at Barnes and Noble. Um, you can buy it from Amazon, but it's not as good for the authors if you do. So I would recommend buying it somewhere else. Uh, Amazon, please don't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I have a small amount of copies the only way to get a signed copy right now is to order directly from me. So I have a small amount of copies that if people message me afterwards, um, we can arrange it so that you can pay for the book to me and then I can mail it to you signed. Um, Unfortunately, we can't have you buy and do an actual signing or anything at the moment. But uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's all the questions from chat. Um, did you have anything you wanted to ask, Joel? Um, no, I, I think we covered quite a quite a lot of my questions um, that you had in there. Um, is pig and pig and whistle in the book? Pig and whistle is in the book. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't. Um, I don't think I have a picture of them. They might have been in the pictures that were not of the highest standard quality that I needed. Um, but yeah, pig and whistle is definitely in there. So is town pride, the Milky Way. Um, the Milky Way, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. A custard shop that was by the airport that was like a little concrete block <laughs> so, 
Yeah. How about the uh, the night owl? Is the night over the there? The night by owl there? is in there as well. Mm-hmm. What I love about the night owl. They is just that... posted that they they're down for the season though now. Oh really? Yeah. Well, I mean that makes sense. It's November. I mean, but they they were also voted the best burger in Milwaukee recently. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and what I like about them is that they close when they run out of meat. So <laughs> oh, that's how they do it. Okay. Yeah. So they order a certain <laughs> amount of meat um, for their orders, and I'm not sure if this is still how they do it, but historically they order a certain amount of meat, they will grind it, and then you know once they they sell the last meat the meat burger they sell less burger yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they close down for the day so huh yeah so sometimes they might not be open all night long but yeah a lot, a lot of familiarity with people with with liking that one mm-hmm. um you've got sandy here that worked at pig and giovanni so oh that's so cool maybe she can share some more restaurant some more um uh, items for us you know yeah. some more recipes <laughs> yeah, that would be great. This this um, presentation will live on Facebook, right? So you can go and comment after um, with any you know fun things, fun yeah. memories that you have, and things like that. So. Or any questions, and we'll we'll try to get Jennifer to see if she can answer them, or anybody else, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Jackie, I see Al's Drive-In is not in the book. I don't know that I know of Al's Drive-In. Um, well, speed- that's that's the happy days, I think. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And happy well, days. there we go. <laughs> um, so there's a there is a story about happy days in the book um, about how people think one custard stand was the inspiration, but it was actually another one. And, another one, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, Mary Louise Speed Queen is in the book. I actually got together with the granddaughter of the owner um, to to get some pictures, and the, it's just it was so lovely. We had such a great You're time going. Street, right? What? Brady Street, right? Is that where Speed Queen was? I don't, I don't think so, but I'd have to double check. So, yeah. Um, that, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. I, there were a lot of places I wanted to include, but I couldn't because they were outside the city bounds. Like, I know there's one in Shorewood that's in there. Um, I'm, and uh, Pandles is in there, and they're not, like, Milwaukee City. Sure, yeah. sure. But maybe in the next book, Greater Milwaukee Area. Great. Right there now. you go. <laughs> Like you don't have enough on your plate, right? Oh. Are you working on anything right now, Jennifer? Another book after this or taking a little break? Oh, uh, I think I'm taking a break. <laughs> yeah. I would like to do, I'm writing a proposal for a cookbook, um, but that's kind of been on the back burner since COVID started. So yeah, there's a, just a lot of small projects. I started a podcast and then I'm just trying to, trying to get by. Sure. <laughs> yeah, my friend yeah. and I have a podcast about, macabre travel so that's kind of fun <laughs> well i think this will make a wonderful addition jennifer to our, uh, our milwaukee foodie scene that we have so it's not just all brats and beer but we got plenty of that too yeah definitely <laughs> oh and there's another presentation on december 1st with historic milwaukee so if anybody knows anyone that wasn't able to make it to this one they can attend that one um, and and or ask any new questions you might have mm-hmm, exactly and historic milwaukee has uh um, copies of the book for sale as well. And I just want to, Christine in, in the comments says that she would love to pop over to Coffee Trader right now. <laughs> and Christine was um, an integral part to the creation of this book and she's thanked in the acknowledgement. So Christine, thank you. You were so helpful, especially with information about Coffee Trader, which I really appreciated. So. All right. Thank you once again, Jennifer. Yeah. And thank thank you, you everybody for, uh, for watching, tuning in tonight. And uh, again, this will be available on uh, the Facebook for um, the Bayview Historical Society, the Chanel Museum Historical Society, and then it'll be also up on um, the Chanel's uh, YouTube page. So anybody else who might want to share it too, they'll be there. Yeah, thank you everybody.